Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. I'd like to begin our time of study with a word, and that is preparation. God had brought the children of Israel to Har Sinai, Mount Sinai, in the hopes that they would prepare themselves to receive his instruction. We have seen in two different chapters how Israel has failed, how they were not prepared, but nevertheless, God has not forsaken his covenant. Moses has interceded for the people that God would forgive them, that God would renew his covenantal blessings with this people, his covenantal purposes with the children of Israel. And now the children of Israel, they are being called to depart from that place, Mount Sinai, with a renewal to enter into the land. And we see that God is going to send, we'll see this this week, we'll see it more clearer next week. In fact, last week, there was a hint to this that God would send one to bring the people into the land. And this one has great significance. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Exodus and Exodus chapter 33. Tonight, we're going to look at the first 11 verses. We read in verse 1, And the Lord spoke to Moses. Now, that's one of the most common expressions in the Torah. Vedeber Hashem el Moshe. And the Lord spoke to Moses. And here again, that sentence simply speaks of divine revelation being given to Moses. The reason why I want to emphasize this fact is because it's only through divine revelation that we can arrive at the location that God wants us to be. And this is what we see early on in this 33rd chapter. And the Lord spoke to Moses and he says this, Go bring up from this, meaning from this place, Bring up from this place, referring to Mount Sinai, you and the people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt. Now he's saying something. There's been a purpose. The exodus from Egypt. It is not to remain in this place, but to leave this place. This was a place of preparation. This was a place of equipment. And even though Israel failed, realize there is going to be another generation. This is so significant. It's going to be that next generation that takes possession of the land. So this renewal, this purpose being stated once more to go up into the land that God has promised the people, it is for that next generation. And I've shared with you, there are many hints Many times that there are references in regard to the kingdom to that next generation. Always that next generation has kingdom implications. So once more, he says, You and the people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt to the land, this is the land of Israel, the land which I have promised to Abraham Yitzchak, and Yaakov. There are two reasons, two reasons why the patriarchs are mentioned there. First and foremost, we see three. Three for the purpose of revealing something, documenting something. And what I always say, and this principle, if you apply it to your life, 
it will change dramatically your life. It is a key for transformation. See, what was unique about the patriarchs? Will you say, well, they had faith. Yes, they did. But how was that faith uh, uh, demonstrated? What was it that manifests that they believed in God? And the answer is this. They took to heart God's promises, his covenantal promises. And it was their pursuit of the promises of God that demonstrated, that manifested their faith. They were unique because they were interested in God's promises. This is what happens frequently. We know that the enemy, and I'm speaking about Hasatan, Satan, that he is the father of lies. He practices deception. And what is his number one means of de deception? To get people to turn away from God's promises and embrace our own desires. He is a champion of getting individuals to believe that my desires are really the promises of God. They are not. The promises of God never originate with me. They are not something that I ever dreamed of. They are not something that I saw as my destiny. They are not something that I felt that this is what I'm for. Rather, the promises of God always come through surprising revelation. You look at the people that God spoke to, God used. What do we know about them? None of them. For example, did Avraham, did he have it within his mind? Was it his destiny that he felt all of his life? That he was going to leave Haran? That he was going to go to a land? A land that was unknown to him? Is this something that he had dreamed? No. It was all new revelation. It did not originate with him. So too always is the promise of God. It is not something you stumble upon. It's not something that, that you have thought about all your life that it just feels right. No, no, and no. It is something that, that usually, I would say, always is something that is a surprise to you. Something that you feel inadequate. Something that, that you have apprehensiveness about. And it's only when you rely upon him, his provision, his equipment, his leadership, his, his assistance, only then are you able to be possessors of the promises of God. So he says here, which I have sworn to Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, saying to your seed, here's another reference to that next generation, to your seed, I will give it. Now, God's sovereign, he's giving this land to your seed. Remember, don't believe, and we talked about this, and this will be coming out, this week or perhaps just did a special teaching from Isaiah 19 that is preparation for the the latter part of Isaiah 19 and people constantly they misrepresent what Isaiah 19 those last concluding verses speak to and they say oh it's an Abrahamic restoration it is not what we see is that Abraham's promise went specifically to Yitzchak. And Yitzchak's promise went specifically to Jacob. And Ishmael and Esau, they are removed. Now, they can find redemption through faith. The same faith that Abraham had, that he demonstrated. Faith in the gospel. So a descendant of Ishmael can be saved by the gospel. But Ishmael is not going to be restored in sharing 
leadership with Yitzchak. There is not this, this epicenter of Abraham's family, meaning Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael. Isaac's sons, Jacob, and Esau come together. In fact, when we look prophetically at Esau, Esau is a man who is perverse and evil, that God cursed, that God hated. And those that belong to him and his character have no hope, only those who remove themselves from Edom and wants to join in a submissive way to the covenantal promise that was given to Jacob. So when it says, your seed, ultimately it's B'nai Yaakov, the sons of Jacob. Now look to verse 2. Notice the last thing we talked about at the end of verse 1 is promise. The patriarchic promise. What's that? A covenant. Abraham's covenant. And notice that it says, verse 2, and I will sin before you. Now, this is going to be important next week because Moses is going to go before God next week somewhat confused because he's paid attention. He's heard at the end of of chapter 32. Let's go back to it. Look, if you would, to verse 34. Exodus 32, verse 34, where he says, Behold, in the middle of the verse, my messenger will go before you. The first reference. Now he says, verse 2 of chapter 33, same word. I will send before you a messenger. And what will this messenger do? He will bring victory, victory over the enemy. He says, and I will, and the implication is through him, this messenger, I will cast out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Prezrasites, the Hivites, and the Jezbasites. Let's say it in Hebrew. It's actually easier for me to say it. ha Kaani, ha Imori, ve ha Chati, ha Parazi, ve ha Chavi, ve ha Yibusi. So what do we notice there? Six different people. Now, six relates to grace. And what we see here is, it is God's grace. It's not because... The children of Israel deserve it. They merit it. God swore through a covenantal commitment that if you enter into this covenant, how? By faith. Then God will act and he will do something. He will move by sending his messenger and through him, God is going to cast out these six nations. Now, sometimes seven, sometimes eight are mentioned. And the reason for the different lists is to teach us different things through the number of people groups or nations that they're speaking to. So God says, I will send before you a messenger and I will cast out these people. And look now to verse 3. And to a land, the land that flows with milk and honey, for... I will not go up in your midst. Now, I would highlight that because we see something. We see much information being given to the reader. And if we we don't emphasize it, if we just read past it, we're going to miss out. Now, why do I know to emphasize this, this statement? Because of, of some divine revelation? Absolutely not. Because I've learned a principle. And that is when things are repeated in a passage, one of the primary purposes for that is emphasis. So this phrase is said several times. It's not because someone is smarter. It's because usually they don't lean on their own understanding. But through prayer and effort, Those two things go together. God honors that. 
prayer and effort. And what do both of them have in common? Time. It takes time to pray. It takes time to exert an effort. So it's when you read this over and over and pray, and here's the problem. You might be at a disadvantage because if you're looking at it in a translation, here's one of the problems. Many times when things are repeated in Hebrew, that same language, the same vocabulary, what happens? In English, they alter it. They put a synonym. They don't like to be redundant, but it's the redundancy of the vocabulary that causes the reader to acknowledge. This is being repeated over and over. Therefore, it must have significance. So because I've read this, I know this phrase, look at it again, end of, of verse 3, literally middle of verse 3, where he says, Lo e'ele be'kirbecha. I will not go up in your midst. Now, why is that significant? Well, God is saying something. He is saying to Moses, and we're going to see that, that Moses, for the most part, doesn't grasp it initially. And that is this. Moses is under the impression that when they get to the land of Israel, that this fulfills all of God's covenantal promise. They have arrived and the kingdom's going to begin. But we know this is not the case. The exodus from Egypt is a paradigm. It is something that gives us a vision to understand what that final redemption, the work of Messiah, is going to be like. That's why Messiah died on Passover. We learn so much about the first Passover that influences us in order to rightly understand Messiah's Passover. So he's saying here, when we look in the middle of verse 3, and it says, Lo e'ele be'kirbecha, I will not go up into your midst. This is saying to Moses, this is not going to bring about the conclusion of my covenantal promise just because you're entering into the land. I'm not going to dwell in your midst in the same way that he's going to dwell in the kingdom of God. It's a paradigm taking possession of the land. Why not? Well, notice what he says. Ki am keshe orif ata. Because a stiff-necked people are you. Now, you in in the biblical languages can be singular or plural. I would expect this to be plural, but it's singular. The first time it's singular, he's going to say it again, and it's going to be plural. But the point here is all the people. He looks at them as one person. They all have this tendency, this characteristic upon them, a stiff neck. We talked about that last week. Kashay Orf. Orf is the back of the neck. And it's stiff. It's hard. It's unwilling to what? Bend. It's an idiom for the lacking of humility. And let me say something. If one is not humble, God is not going to do much in that person's life. Humility is foundational. Why was Moses, Moses chosen? The scripture says that he was the servant of God because he was the most humble of all people. So God says to, to Moses, I'm not going up in your midst because a stiff-necked people are you. Less, and here's the key, less I will devour you on the way. Now, when he says devour you, it's singular again, but He's speaking about the people. Now, what's the problem? Here's what they're lacking. God cannot dwell among them like he will in the new Jerusalem, in that final state of the kingdom. Why will God do so then? Because of Messiah's work of redemption. Why can he not be among them now? Because they have not received true redemption. 
That exodus from Egypt, that Passover experience, is a paradigm. It gives us a vantage point, a perspective, a, a vision for understanding generally what redemption is. But the true redemption is not with the blood of a literal Passover sacrifice. But true redemption is only through the blood of the true Lamb of God, Messiah Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth. And this is why he's telling the people at this time, if I come among you, I will consume you on the way. Verse 4. And the people heard this evil word. Now, why is it evil? Well, the people heard and they knew that they were not in the will of God. That's what evil speaks of. That this was not what God wanted to do because of their condition. Now, why isn't he doing this? Well, I've already referred to you twice. Exodus 20 the people twice stood at a distance. At Mount Sinai in Exodus 32, the golden calf, that the people ate, drank, and they rose up and they played. They did not take seriously God's instruction for preparation. And instead of taking hold of the commandments that were given, what do we know? That they were broken because of their rebellious nature being a stiff-necked people. So it's very clear here when we see here that this was not God's original plan. But the sins of the people did not thwart ultimately God from accomplishing his will. But he's not going to do it with this generation. It's going to be, and here's the key again, with that next generation. Look again at verse 4. The people heard this evil word, and what did they do? They yit abalu, they mourned. Now, some Bibles translate it different, but this is where evil is mourning. This is the verb for mourning, and it has to do with death. This word shows that their rebelliousness for that generation is going to bring about death. God's will and his purposes, they're not going to experience because of their spiritual condition at Mount, at Mount Sinai because of their stiff-neckedness. God's going to utilize the next generation. So the people heard that God wasn't going to complete his purposes with them, and they mourned, and they did not place, a man did not place, Ed Yo alive. Now what's Ed Yo? This is his ornament now in modern hebrew it can speak to a piece of jewelry but here most of the rabbinical commentators point out that it's used symbolically it is used as a reference for kind of a a symbol that designates them as his people maybe like a Badge, something that, that shows that they are identified as the people of God. And God is saying here, you, and we'll see this later on, are not going to be the ones. It's not that generation, but the next generation, with the exception of who? Yahushua and Kalev. Rock these two men, only these two men from that generation makes it in. So, no man place his, his badge upon himself. Verse 5. And the Lord said to Moses, I say to the children of Israel that you, now it's not ata, you singular, but you plural. So this change from singular to plural is significant. It shows and emphasizes God sees them all, and individually, they were stiff-necked. And now he's looking generally, and there's no change. They are a stiff-necked people. Rege achad. One moment, I will go up in your midst. The implication is that he won't. Because of their stiff neck. And what does this refer to? 
a lack of humility and learn something. It is impossible to repent without humility. Humility is foundational for beginning to walk with God, to begin the, the repentance of a person's life. And that's why it's so important, this, this concept of conviction. Now, occasionally people send me videos to watch having a religious significance. And one, a good friend of mine, sent me one concerning a prayer. And this was a, a prayer of receiving the gospel. And here's the problem. When you, when you listen to this one, and he's very well-known, very popular, has hundreds of thousands of subscribers to his YouTube channel, here's the problem. When he offers an invitation, it's simply receive the love of God. Allow God into your life that he can bless you, that he can, can love you, that he can change your life, transform your life. That's all. Nothing about sin, nothing about repentance, nothing about the cross, nothing about the blood. And what I would say is this. If that's all that people hear, that, that through me saying yes to one name, Yeshua, I say yes to him because I want God's love. I want God's uh, to work in my life. I want God to give me the desires of my heart. If that's what a so-called profession of faith is, it is not biblical faith. And many people you can fill stadiums with a false gospel. But when a true gospel is presented that says we I am a stiff-necked person. Me left to myself. There's no humility. There is pride. There is arrogance. There is selfishness. There's a desire for me to get what I want at all costs. And I get angry at anyone who stands in my way. That's humanity. And it's the exact opposite of the example that Yeshua gave when he came as the second man, in contrast to the first man, Adam, in the Garden of Eden. No, we see Yeshua perfectly demonstrates what a true man that is submissive to God displays. And we have failed, as Paul says, we all have fallen short of the glory of God. And therefore, we need to acknowledge our sinfulness. Not just generally, but specifically. We need to think about things that we are doing. See, it's really easy to say, yes, I'm a sinner, and I want God to forgive me for my sin. But here's the problem. I may be meaning, oh, well, I'm not always the nicest I shouldn't be. Sometimes I, I tell a little white lie. Sometimes I'm a little bit too selfish and such. But what about some very dominant sin? See, there are people that come, they, they join a congregation, and they have never been taught that, that this sin, what's going on in their life, something that's foundational in their life, is an abomination. That God requires that you turn away from that. Now here again, you need to be very careful. We cannot turn away from sin by ourselves, through our own power. We need the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But here's the problem. If I am unwilling to acknowledge this sin as sin, and I say, well, I have no, yes, I sin. Yes, I'm a sinner, generally speaking. But I'm not going to stop that. I, I, love, I love that. I, I'm going to continue to do that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But the Bible says, yes, it is. Well, I, I just reject that. That is not someone who saved. Now, you can say, yes, that's sin. I struggle with that. In the flesh, I love that. In the flesh, I don't want to stop doing it, but I acknowledge it is wrong. 
And now, out of obedience to God, I want him to turn me away from that. You may struggle. You may, may battle that for years. But you have to acknowledge it. Sin. You have to have a sin, sincere desire to turn away from that. Acknowledge that it's pleasing to God to turn away from that. And it's rebellious to embrace it. If we don't understand that as part of the true gospel, we have not found salvation. And that's why people are confused and they say, well, well, I see this person, he says he was a believer, but now he's, he's living differently. He's turned away. They were never a believer because you can't know Yeshua, experience him, and say, I don't want him in my life. I don't believe in him any longer. No one who truly has experienced Yeshua would ever say no to him. It just cannot be done. We look here once more. He says, you, you are, are a stiff-necked people. And, and in one moment, and the implication is, if only for one moment I would go up in your midst, what would happen? Vechiliti. I would bring you to an end. So God's revealing something here. It's not that he doesn't want to be part of this people. He cannot be because of the spiritual truth, the spiritual law. If God, who is perfectly holy, if he enters into one who is unredeemed by the blood of Messiah, that one is going to die. And therefore, he says, I will not go up into your midst because if I did, only for a moment, he says, I would bring you to an end. And now, he says, bring down your ornament, that jewelry, from upon you. It's to show that that generation doesn't really belong to him. And that generation is not, listen, is not going to, is not going to experience the promise of God. They're not going to enter into the land of Israel. And do not miss this relationship between the land and the promise of God. Verse 7. Now there's an emphasis on the Ohel Moed, the tent of the meeting. And this is a unique location. And it's in this tent of meaning, meeting, and realize all of this speaks about a process, things that go on in the tent of meeting that allows one to draw near to God temporarily, temporarily to worship him, to experience him. And notice it says, and Moses, he took the tent and he set it up outside the camp removed it from the people. In fact, the next word, harchek, min ha-machane. He distant it from the camp. So there's an emphasis twice that the tent of meeting is outside far from the camp, far from where the people dwelt. And he called it, that is Moses called this, the tent of meeting. Now, this is the word for meeting Ohel Moed, Moed, is the, the objective. It is the destination. It is where one wants to be. And the reason for that is, in a unique way, the presence of God is there. And it shall come about that, that all who seek the Lord, he should go out to the tent of the Moses, which is tent of meeting, excuse me, he should go out to the tent of meeting, <coughs> which is outside the camp. And it shall come about that Moses will go forth to the tent. So if someone has a request, and the implication is wanting insight, what happens? Moses goes out to the tent of the meeting, which is outside the camp. And it shall be that when Moses goes out to the tent, that all the people shall rise up. Now, this is showing reverence for God. That God, in a unique way, is going to meet Moses. And I want to emphasize that. God, in a unique way, is going to meet 
Moses. And what is the purpose? Revelation. The purpose is to respond so that one can know the truth. Let me say it another way. The purpose of God. You'll never know the purposes of God until you know his truth. So once more, the people, they would rise up. All the people would rise up, and every man would stand at the door of his tent. So they would go to the door of one's tent, the entrance. They would stand in reverence and to honor God, and they would watch intently the word Hebitu, not just to see, but to gaze sternly, strictly, and, and carefully as Moses passed by. Now it means after Moses, as he walks by, until he would enter into the tent. They still stayed there, and they did something else. Verse 9, and it came about as Moses entered into the tent that the pillar of the cloud would come down and it would stand at the door of the tent and would speak with Moses. So notice, it is not God himself, but Shkinat Hashem, the dwelling presence in that cloud that would come down and stand at the tent before Moses and speaks with him. Verse 10. And all the people saw, the people saw the, the pillar of the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent. And all the people rose up. And what did they do? They bowed down or they worshiped every man at the entrance of his tent. So they rose up in reference to acknowledge and then they worship. And this word for worship means to bow down. It's a word that, that, that signifies submissiveness. Verse 11. And verse 11 is going to be our last verse. And the Lord spoke to Moses. Now, he didn't enter into the midst of Moses, but he stood. This, this pillar of the cloud, which represented the presence of God. And it says, and the Lord spoke to Moses, panim el panim, face to face, just as a man would speak to his neighbor. And then he would return to the camp and the servant of his, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, the young man. Now it's word na'ar, which means an adolescent, so a very young male. He would not depart from the midst of the tent. Now, that's where we're going to pick up next week. We have to ask ourselves, and I'll leave you with this, why is Joshua mentioned? What is unique about this one called Yehoshua? That's exactly how it should be enunciated. Yehoshua. Why is he there? What is it speaking about? And how does this fact that he's emphasized, that he's mentioned, how does that correspond to the rest of this chapter? And that's what we're going to look at next week as we continue our study of the book of Exodus and chapter 33, the second part. Until then, may God bless you. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.